Let's just uh, read God's word together, and then we're going to uh, uh, pray, and then we'll, we'll speak about the, what we've read together. So we're reading from um, Luke chapter 9, and we're going to read this in sections, actually, as we go through it. Um, and this is the, the first section. It's entitled uh, Luke chapter 9, verses 1 uh, down to 6, and it's entitled Jesus Sends Out the Twelve Apostles. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal. And he said to them, take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we pray for your help this morning as we contemplate and consider what we have read together. We pray for the Holy Spirit who will open our hearts and our understandings to truths that you would have us know, and so that we might see the Lord Jesus in all his loveliness and beauty and glory, and all the honour will be his. So, Lord, we ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we see this continuing journey where the Lord Jesus is sending out his 12 apostles. Remember, these apostles, these disciples, are selected by him specially for a particular mission. And of course, it's always amazing, isn't it, when we think about who the Lord Jesus chooses to carry out this mission that he has. It's a, it's a world-transforming ministry, a world-transforming mission, uh, and he chooses 12 disciples. And when we look at who those are, those who are going to be sent out, well, really, they're a bunch of nobodies. <laughs> so if you are a nobody this morning, we all are really, aren't we? You know, we, 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 we're not kind of like really very... Uh, influential or special in this world today are we we not uh, uh, we don't ring up the phone and say uh, hello Kia how are you you know <laughs> um, we perhaps are not known by important people um, but you know it's interesting to see who the Lord chooses to do his mission to do his work fishermen I guess these were manual workers maybe I was trying to think when I was thinking about this who would fishermen equate to today who do you think would be fishermen today uh, I think probably they would be bricklayers and joiners and uh, uh, um, just ordinary people doing manual work, uh, laborers of, of no particular um, uh, significance, just ordinary people. Fisherman, tax collector, who was a crooked tax collector, he worked for the Romans, he'd, he'd gone against the Jewish people, uh, a freedom fighter, and we see the these this group of nobodies who the Lord brings together and chooses them as his, his disciples to do his work. And they become the apostles. And then it's, it's upon them that the, 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 and their teaching that the church is built. Wow. <laughs> you know, if you were going to start a worldwide movement, you wouldn't have chosen these men. Absolutely not. But Jesus does. And why? Because they are weak and they're insignificant, and they're not full of themselves, and they're not full of their own abilities and skills and all the rest of it, but that in their weakness, they are dependent upon the Lord to do the work. And in God's work, it's always Christ who does the work, and it's always for his glory. And the problem is when men come along and think they can do it in their own strength and their own ability, then it draws the glory away from the Lord. So the Lord chooses the weak, the insignificant, the unimportant, to carry out his work and he is going to send them out on this work, this world mission. And these men, remember, the apostles apart from one of them, of course, who Judas, who betrayed him, uh, these men were going to be used mightily of God in the establishment of the early church, uh, in their teaching, their preaching, God was going to use them mightily to change the world. And here we see him appointing them and then sending them out to do his work, and we notice that when he sends them out, it's Christ who gives them the power and Christ that gives them the authority. And that's the key in doing his work. That it's got to be done through his power, the power in the indwelling Holy Spirit. He empowers us to do the work, 
and it's in his name that we go forth. And whilst we might not think we are particularly significant or important in this world today, if we are sent, if we are his disciples, we are on the world's greatest mission. Don't forget that. We are involved with the world's greatest, greatest mission. You may think you're a nobody. But if you are a child of God, if you're born again of the Holy Spirit, you are on the greatest mission that this world has today, and that's to proclaim the name of the Lord Jesus. Never forget that. We shouldn't become proud and arrogant. You know who I am? I'm a child of God. We're not going to be proud and arrogant, are we? We're not going to be going up to people and saying, you shouldn't speak to me like that because... No, we're going to be humble, as he was. We're going to be serving... But we must never forget that we are on his mission and we are going forth with the word of the Lord. And, you know, we are those who are given the responsibility of seed sowing. These disciples were told to go and preach the message and to heal and cast out demons. But we ourselves today are also on a mission. We received a commendation from the Lord, or a command from the Lord to go forth into all the world and preach the gospel. And that goes to every one of us. We are all on mission to do that. We are seed sowers. And by the way, it's very easy to sow a seed, isn't it? <laughs> you don't need to go to theology college. You don't need to have a degree in theology. You don't need to uh, uh, know your Bible fully, completely, and know all the details. You don't need to know all the deep-seated doctrines. Well, it's good to know these things because they encourage us and build us up. But a child can sow a seed. A little child. Um, some, some, some years ago, many years ago now, when my brother uh, and, and I, we were all on holiday with our cousins in Scotland, um, and uh, we, we went along to a, a local church in Inverness, actually, where it was, and they had an open-air work, and they were giving out gospel tracts, and my brother, who was, and his cousin, were probably about, about seven or eight at the time, managed to get some of these gospel tracts, uh, and they were going to go on mission for the Lord Jesus, you know, on on the uh, campsite where we were, it wasn't a campsite, there was lodges where we were staying. There were all these lodges in this forest. And these two seven and eight-year-olds were going to go out on mission. And so they went round uh, all the doors of, of, of the lodges and they knocked on the door and they said, uh, can I sell you a tract? <laughs> so they, ch they were selling the gospel tracts around this holiday park. Uh, and when my mum and dad found out, they weren't very happy. Um, so they made them go and give all the money back. <laughs> Just seven and eight. But they were on a mission. They were sowing the seed. It's as simple as giving a gospel tract over. It's as simple as saying a word, quoting a verse. We are his ambassadors. We are here with a message. Let's not think for a minute. But we aren't important. We've got the single most important task that there is to do in world, the world today. And that is to tell us of others about the Lord Jesus. We have the answer. It's Christ. If we don't tell others about that, wow, what a responsibility. And there are lots of ways which we do. And some people can preach it. And some people can give a testimony. And some people can just tell others what the Lord Jesus has done for them. And some people just pass on a little leaflet. Um, many years ago, I gave a, a little... Uh, a little leaflet, it was one of these daily breads, to a friend of mine in a school assembly. <coughs> Couldn't talk to him. I, hadn't, I was sat next to him in year two, of the, the uh, second year, which would be year eight these days, uh, uh, of the school. I sat next to him uh, then, and then I, so many years later, I think probably about the fifth year, uh, I just get, handed him a daily bread in assembly one day. Uh, and he took it home, and he started to read it. And he filled in the little form and he sent off and he got them sent. And one day God used one of those daily readings to bring him to salvation. And he took me into his bedroom one day and he said, Wes, there's the spot when I knelt before by my bedside and I asked the Lord to save me and forgive me. And just a simple handing out of leaflets. Let's capture the vision for that. So the Lord Jesus, he sends out his disciples. He gives them the power and authority to do the work. He's given them the ability to heal the sick. He's given them the ability to cast out demons. And you may say, well, why don't we have that ability today? Uh, why don't we have the ability to heal? Surely if 
I could go into Withenshaw Hospital and empty the place and heal everyone, then surely people would listen to the gospel. But no, not really. Because they didn't when the Lord Jesus was here, did they? Even though he did all of that healing work, there were still relatively few numbers who were actually saved and followed him. It's not about signs and wonders, it's about the Lord Jesus, and it's about telling others about him. And you know, we don't really have time to go into this in a lot of detail, but we have a different scenario in these days. Those healing gifts which were given to the apostles to mark them out as apostles, to show others that they were ordained of God in the work of God, with the power of God, to heal those were sign gifts that were given and used to authenticate the men of God at that particular time. Well, today we have the scriptures. And our mission today is not necessarily to go around healing people, but our mission today is to go around and spread the word because we have the scriptures and we teach the word and we spread the word in all sorts of different formats. And yes, we know God can heal today and yes, we know God can uh, uh, cast out demons and all of those things yes he can but that specific gifting was given sign gifts given to those early apostles to authenticate them and you see that if you do a study on this you'll see that in the early days that Paul had the ability to uh, heal people he had the ability to raise Eutychus back to life again and yet as you see further on in his ministry you then read uh, about Trophimus um, who he would leave uh, at a particular place, Miletum, sick, 2 Timothy 4.20. Um, you would read about Timothy, who was told to take a little wine for his stomach's sake. He obviously had a stomach problem. Paul himself had problems perhaps with his eyesight, uh, and he wasn't healed. And so we see that latterly, as time goes on, uh, the emphasis is on teaching the word and the apostles' doctrine and less on, on, on the emphasis in, in relation to the, the sign gifts that were given. And so the Lord, he sends out his disciples and he gives them these instructions, take nothing for your journey, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, do not have two tunics, and whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave the town, shake off the dust from your feet, as a testimony against them. So the Lord is going to provide for his workers through those who he, they encounter in these villages so that they won't need staff, they won't need a bag, they won't need bread. It will all be provided for them. Uh, and that is a way in which the Lord can work, that he can provide. Uh, and yet, for the majority of people, the intention today is that we do work. Paul himself, the Apostle Paul, as we've been hearing already, he worked with his hands, that he might not be dependent upon the saints uh, for his income. And so predominantly, the day and age in which we live today is that we work, we earn, and what we earn we use to further the work of the Lord, to give to the Lord for his glory primarily, and then we are allowed to have houses to live in and have food to eat and clothes to wear. Uh, and the Lord is the provider of all of those things. He is faithful. We must never forget that. That it's from him. You know, there's a great danger when you think mm, you're good at your job. I'm good at this job. My money, I earned it. I got that sale, I got that commission. No, no, no. It all comes from the Lord, doesn't it? He gives the strength, he gives the ability, he gives the wisdom, he gives the success. Let's face it, I know in our workplace and in our environment, we, we do have to work, uh, and the, the guys here are involved doing that. And we do pray that the Lord will bless our efforts, but we recognize that uh, everything that we have comes from him and it's for his glory. So ultimately, that's the key thing. Uh, he will provide, he does provide for his mission, for his work, for his servants as they do his work. And ours is to preach the message of the gospel, to bear the good news. For them it was to tell of the coming king, that the Messiah had come. And they went, and they went through the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. 
and so the Great Commission. Who the Lord chooses and how he uses them and how he meets them in their need uh, is seen uh, today. The other thing I want to just say uh, in relation to this, and I think this is noteworthy, um, and we see that there are two aspects to their mission. First of all, there's a spiritual aspect where they're telling forth the message of the kingdom about the Lord Jesus, that the king has come, that he is the Messiah. But then there's another aspect to the work that they're doing, and that is of a practical nature, and that is that they should help people. They should heal the sick. And over the years, I believe those two aspects of gospel work do work together. Um, when a missionary goes out to Africa, my parents were missionaries in Tanzania for 13 years, and they ran a hospital. They worked in a hospital. My mum was a midwife, my dad was a, a nurse as well, and he did dentistry as well. And, and they worked amongst the people, practically. And as they worked, and as they showed kindness, because they did it free of charge, then they were given opportunities in the gospel. Um, and so I do believe we see a practical aspect to the work of the gospel, where we're helping people, we're drawing along alongside people, we're serving people, uh, and that can be in our ordinary workplace, by the way. Um, and uh, at the same time, we're also preaching the gospel. Those two things go together. When we work with homeless people in Manchester for a number of years, um, often people would say to us, when we took food and clothing and all sorts of things to them, they would say to us, well, why are you doing this? And then, well, we told them. <laughs> we told them about the love of God. We told them about a caring and forgiving God, and we, it opened up the gospel. There we are. Then we move on to this next little section, which is all about Herod. Uh, and we're reading from verse 7 down to verse 9. Now, Herod, the Tetrarch, heard all that was happening. And he was perplexed because it was said by some that John had been raised from the dead, by some, by some that Elijah had appeared, and by others that one of the prophets of old had risen. Herod said, John I beheaded, but who is this about whom I hear such things? And he sought to see him. I just wonder with Herod, as he's hearing about these wonderful miracles that are happening and, and all that's going on, he thought he dealt with John, by the way, John never did any miracles, or any of that at all. He just preached, he preached the message of repentance. He thought he dealt with John, and yet here he's hearing more news of the Lord Jesus and the work of the Lord Jesus, and I believe he's troubled by his conscience. I am sure that Herod didn't want, well, we read that in Scripture, he didn't really want John to be beheaded. But to save face, he allows it to take place, and here's a man who's troubled by his conscience. Wow, what a serious thing he's done to the head, the messenger of the Lord, the Elijah of that day. And yet John falls in the line of many others before him who were prophets of the Lord, who are destroyed, who are killed, who are silenced because they bring the word of the Lord. And so I think Herod's troubled in his conscience. And it, isn't it interesting that although Herod wants to see the Lord Jesus, and then ultimately when Jesus does meet Herod during his trial, he doesn't say a word to him. He does not say a single word to Herod. Wow. You think of the judgment that sits on a man like Herod for what he did. Uh, and Jesus uh, would not say a word to him. Let's just move then on to this next uh, story um, which is the feeding of the 5,000. We're not going to get time to, to, uh, to, to go on any further than that. But let's just read it. Uh, from verse 10, on their return, the apostles told him all that they had done, and he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. And when the crowds learned it, they followed him, and he welcomed them and spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now the day began to wear away, and the twelve came and said to him, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and countryside to find lodgings and get provisions, for we are here in a desolate place. But he said to them, You give them something to eat. And they said, We have no more than five loaves and two fishes, unless we go and buy food for all these people. For there were five thousand men. And he said to his disciples, Have them sit down in groups of fifty each. And they did so, and had them all sit down. 
And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said, A blessing over them. And he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, twelve baskets of broken pieces. I love this story of the feeding of the 5,000. Well, 5,000 men, there could potentially have been uh, 10,000, 15,000 people there with women and children added. What a feat. Uh, and uh, it's very interesting that we learn some uh, important lessons from this little story. First of all, the importance of rest. Um, we see that he took them and withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida, and the purpose of that was for rest. The purpose of that was for rest. Our Lord is sympathetic to the fact that we need times of rest, times of recovery, particularly if those can be times alone with him, listening to him, reading his word, enjoying the beauty of his creation. And yet they are also potentially dangerous times as well, because sometimes when we step out of the busyness of life and we take rest, then we become, and we're under attack then. Uh, and I've experienced that myself. But the Lord is sympathetic to our need for rest. Are you tired? Are you weary? It's good to take a time out, a time of rest. The Lord was sympathetic to that. Well, of course, the rest wasn't long lived because, of course, we notice that the crowds follow. Verse 11, when the crowds learned it, they followed him and he welcomed them. How would you react if you went on holiday from the work that you did and when you arrived in the place of your holiday, all the people who you worked with and you were serving had come to see you? And I'm not saying this in the context of last week, because it was a pleasure to have you guys. It really was. But imagine if that was the case, you know. How would you feel? How would you feel? Oh, I wanted a rest. I wanted a break. I need a break, Lord. How does the Lord respond? He welcomes them. Isn't that interesting? He was so absorbed with their needs... He loved them so much, he cared for them so much, he was all about them. Ultimately, that's what mattered to him. You know, we, we like a bit of less, we like a bit of a holiday, don't we, you know. <laughs> and the Lord taught that, to have rest. But, note this, that when, when the rest didn't come, he wasn't sending them away. No, he was welcoming them. What would the disciples have done? What was the solution to the problem that these disciples were confronted with as the Lord brought it to them, these hungry people? And by the way, if we read the other accounts of this feeding of the 5,000, these people have been with him for quite a few days, you know. They'd have run out of all of their food. They couldn't get enough of the Lord Jesus. They just wanted to listen and listen and listen. <laughs> and they run out of food. And that was the reason why there was such a problem here. And uh, what does the Lord do? Well, the disciples' solution is this, send them away. Send them away. How does the Lord resolve this? Does he send them away? Well, that's a sensible thing to do. We can't, we can't even consider feeding this number of people. We, we've got to send them away. No, not the Lord. <laughs> no, he's going to provide for them. He can provide for them. He is the Lord of glory. He is the one who created the means by which bread could be made. He's the one who created the fish. He's just going to do a great miracle of further creatorial power. As he takes a loaf and he breaks it and he breaks it and he breaks it and he takes the fish and he breaks it and he breaks it. And he's going to feed the hungry people because he cares for them. He's compassionate. He shows love in action. They mean everything to him. This is the heart of his mission is to serve others, is to be there for others, is to live his life for others. And if there's one lesson I'm trying to learn in my Christian life, and that is this, is that really I'm not here for myself. I'm here ultimately to serve him, and he wants me to serve others. And then he kindly lets he, me have some rest as well. <laughs> You know, 
Sometimes people say to me, when are you going to retire, Wes? I think some people at Renewal Less would be glad when I retire. <laughs> Maybe that's why they asked the question. <laughs> do we retire as Christians? I don't think we do. I just think we keep going until we drop dead. And yes, in different capacities and with different strengths and different abilities at different times. Yes, of course. But we never retire. You know, there's everything in me that might sort of think, oh, wouldn't it be nice to uh, uh, go and buy one of these camper vans and then uh, sort of travel, travel all the way around the, in Britain uh, and then travel over to Europe and just put my feet up and retire? Would I be happy? Would I be satisfied? I wouldn't. I don't think I would. Because what brings joy and delight in our hearts and our lives is to be serving him for his glory. All about his mission. All about his work, seeking whom we can serve for him, for his glory. And so what we need to be aware of as his people is looking out for hungry people. And that might not just be physically hungry people, but spiritually hungry people. Are there spiritually hungry people that you encounter in your lives? Are there people asking you about your faith? They want to know what's different about you. Why are you always smiling? Why have you got a joy? What's missing in my... There's something missing in my life. You've got something. Are we feeding hungry people with God's word? Let's be on his mission. Let's be like him in the hearts of compassion, of love, and not sending them away, of not making the problem someone else's problem, but making their problem our problem and willing to serve in whatever way he leads and guides. And I'll tell you this, he will meet every single need. He will meet every single need. He is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ever ask or think. Honestly, we, we testify to that. We have a great God who does great things and he has a great mission and we're all part of it. And you know, we've seen that over the years when we first started to rent a, a, a unit in Meadow Mill. All those years ago, we were making plans to, uh, you know, to, to sort of uh, um, look at ways of paying the rent for that, you know, remortgage the house or whatever <laughs> to pay the rent. But you know, we look back and we see the faithfulness of God and we've never had to do that. And he's always provided and he's always met the need. Always. And he always will as long as he's at the center of it and it's for his glory. You know, our God is up for big works and big jobs and big projects as well as small ones and little ones. Let's not underestimate him. He can feed 5,000 men. And though no, just final point to make there. These people were fed by him. He multiplies the bread. They are all fed. Notice, notice the order. Our God is a God of order. He makes them sit down in 50s. And the mission goes on. He provides. The disciples distribute. And everyone is fed. And they're more than fed. The Bible says that they're satisfied. The word says they're satisfied. By what they have. Verse 17. And they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, 12 baskets of broken pieces. You know, when God meets the need, when he feeds the hungry, they are satisfied. That's the only time we're really satisfied in our lives, is when he feeds us spiritually, uh, in other ways as well. He satisfies us, he satisfies them. And so much so that there were leftovers. Interesting, isn't it, that the disciples had to pick up the leftovers. How many baskets were there? Twelve. One each. <laughs> we have a God of abundance who provides for our needs in ways which are satisfy us and go beyond. And these twelve baskets, I'm sure, were useful for the disciples over the coming days to feed further uh, as, as time went on. And so we learn some very important lessons in relation to uh, these from these stories that we have uh, and it is a great privilege and a great honor for us to be on his mission for his glory and we pray that the lord will be the center of that he'll be the power he'll be the one and it's all about him and it's not about ourselves and in our weakness we are useful to him and that we take on the mission of spreading the word of sowing the seed and of responding to the needs of hurting broken broken people broken children, wherever you find yourself 
dealing with the needs of humanity. Let's not be afraid to roll our sleeves up and get involved. And you say, hang on a minute, I can't handle that. I can't deal with that, that's just beyond me. Well, you pray to the Lord and you ask the Lord to lead you and guide you in that, to lead you to someone who you can speak to, you can reach, to give you the wisdom you need to respond to the needs you encounter. So often when we see other people's needs, we want to run away. We don't want to get involved with those people's lives, the difficult lives, problematic lives. What am I letting myself in for? <laughs> you let yourself in for great joy and great blessing in the service of the Lord as we're willing, as he leads and guides, to get involved into his work and mission. Let's just pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Lord Jesus and his great heart of compassion and love and mercy. Thank you for his great provision in the uh, lessons that we've been learning here. We pray, Lord, that you would make us like him. Lord, we pray that we won't be people who send the problems away, but that we look to uh, serve others in the way that you lead and guide. Help us, Lord, to be compassionate and caring and kind. Help us to be courageous and bold in sowing the seed, proclaiming the word, in whatever form that is, and however you enable us to do that, may we have a heart for mission to spread the word. As we ask for your help in these things now and your blessing upon us as your people, we ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus for his glory and honour. Amen.